Yuri Rosso, thank you so much for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. So great to see you. Great. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yes, and Richard here, of course, uh, uh, backing up the team. Uh, so we, we attack you from two fronts. But uh, yeah, no, it's really, it's really great because this is a really interesting perspective on, uh, on, on mental health and mental capacity and uh, how that translates into uh, you know, physicality and, and, and performance. And so, so it's really, really interesting. I'm looking forward to this conversation, Matt and Yuri. Yeah. Yeah, so um, let's start off by yeah, introducing yourself and uh, how you got to where you are. Sure, sure. So I suppose if we go back a long way, it started for me basically in school where I was struggling a bit with mental health and depression, things like that myself. And I was trying to figure out how can I improve my own mindset? So I was in a family of you know psychiatrists and psychologists. So Obviously, I decided I'm not going to talk to any of them about oh, it. Oh, yes, I told you to hit them. I started it out myself. <laughs> so, so I ended up doing uh, quite a bit of research, I ended up studying a bit of uh, organizational psychology, and then I got more and more into it. And, and over time, I was, I was taking a, a very scientific approach to it, I suppose, just by look, looking at what's, what's proven in terms of what protects mental health and what can build mental health up. And, uh, and over time, I found a whole lot of things that really worked for me and really changed my mindset to help me a lot with uh, confidence and, uh, and kind of changed my personality in a way as well to a point where I felt really happy with the person that I had become. Uh, but at the same time, I felt it also took me way too long to figure out all those type of things. So, so that's where I came to the point where I thought, you know, I've done all this research and I've put all these concepts together. Maybe I can create a program that other people can use to, to be able to learn a, a more cohesive system around, you know, what builds resilience, what protects our mental health and be able to apply that in their own lives. And also for practitioners to apply to apply that with their, uh, with their audiences and their patients and clients. So that's where I established uh, Hello Driven, which is an organization really focusing on using resilience as a proactive approach to mental health. And, uh, and through that created uh, the, the predictive six factor resilience model, which is a six, uh, six domain uh, model of resilience underpinned by neuroscience uh, across all the domains. So creating an assessment around that as well, which then quickly got taken up by a whole lot of universities, a whole lot of psychologists started using it in their practices and then kind of exploded from there into all kinds of different industries where now we work with the state emergency services and some of the other uh, emergency services here in New South Wales and in America as well. And, uh, and even in schools where it's used with students and teachers learning these skills and, uh, and all kinds of different contexts, which is uh, just really interesting to see because I suppose it's, it's resilience and it applies to everyone. So it does kind of go into all the kind of different places. I was really taken <laughs> by the just the broad array of um, organizations and people that are, are taking this on board. So like you say, I mean, it's, it's resilience, it's for everybody. And, um, and you're not just working with those like frontline workers, um, but this mm. is like in the corporate space, this is everywhere. Yes. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even just this Friday, I've got a bit of work that I'm doing with, uh, with one of the big banks here, which is teaching them about uh, how can they use resilience in their everyday lives, so both at work, but also at, at home as well. And then there's a new program called Resilience First Aid, where we're looking at the, the very preventative side of it. How can we teach people those language skills so that they can proactively support resilience in others? And, and it kind of comes to that idea of what can we do ahead of time to prevent people from becoming depressed and, and developing mental illness down the track? Because yeah, because this is the, the I mean I'm always fascinated when we have natural capacities uh, like resilience mm. you know like mental health like physical health and so on and so forth which mm. we're we're actually uh, uh, as I often say anything that's good for us has been around for a long time we didn't like no one's inventing something new and giving yeah. it to us what we're doing but we're restoring something that has been downplayed has been reduced has been diminished that I think is as interesting as the story of teaching people how to to discover their uh, resilience, it's almost like rediscovering it. And kind of where does it, where did it go? Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on, because uh, as you were saying back in school, you know, there you were young, what was it that was actually 
um, impacting your natural capacities to to cope and manage. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing because it's it's something that like resilience anybody can learn it, but it is it's not necessarily the case that people will learn it. So there's a lot of different places where it can come from from you know learning it from your parents or learning it from your peers, uh, learning it just by yourself naturally by figuring things out, but then. If it's not really provided and teach and taught in a more structured way, it's easy to fall into maladaptive patterns and things like that that can then uh, go on through throughout the rest of your life. And if you never really go through any kind of therapy or uh, or help to actually look at those type of things that are affecting you, so it's 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 an interesting one, and that's part of why I think it's so important to start looking at teaching this earlier in more structured in a more structured approach. Uh, because yeah, it's, it's just something we see in the data where children start with a lower level of resilience. And, and I guess you can start from, from like zero years old where you've got zero resilience. And then as you, <laughs> as you grow, then there's a divergence that happens there already where some people naturally start to learn resilience and, and develop that more over time where other people don't really learn those skills. And they need to do more to develop that. And, mm-hmm. and I suppose for myself, you know, experiencing bullying and, and I had PTSD as a kid and all that and a whole bunch of things that happened to me that I, I think affected my ability to be resilient at a time when I wasn't aware really of what resilience is and how do I access those skills to activate my own resilience. And, uh, and it took me a long time to really figure that out. And, yeah. and I guess taking time means that... <laughs> I get more clarity yeah. later. But just in there, what I hear is, is we are naturally a co-learning species. Uh, and so uh, probably I'm, what I'm hearing there is, is that this co-learning experience, the, that resilience, so this is a generational thing. So the resilience isn't there in, in, in people around you to teach you resilience. But I guess it's also the fact that we invent these systems. We invent these very... Um, unusual, uh, rare systems like education and like business and and uh, you know all that sort of stuff. So we need to we need to revitalize the the teaching of it, the 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 co learning experience. So that's 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 terrific. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And as you showed, you can do it on your own, but it's a lot slower and a lot more difficult. Yeah. Co learning <laughs> much is is mm. much more effective. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So can we just um, just take a step back and just talk about what is resilience? What are we actually talking about here? Yes. Yeah. And that's one of the big things that I wanted to start with, because it is that kind of nebulous term where mm. you know, everyone's got their own ideas about it. So if if I think about it at a very high level, I define it as advancing despite adversity. So that is, is a bit more of a modernized way of thinking about it, where it's the idea that we're constantly moving towards something that gives us a sense of purpose, something that that motivates us that we can move towards. So, and and it also means that we we don't necessarily wait for adversity before we start planning ahead. Like we can actually pre- be prepared. We can develop skills in advance. So it's not just about bouncing back. It's about more than that. So that's really where we expanded out into the six domains of resilience, which is. Uh, vision, which is about that sense of meaning and purpose. There's composure, which is about your your ability to manage stress, emotional awareness, and so on. There's reasoning, which is more about introspection, planning, and using those cognitive skills. And there's health, which is more the physical aspect, nutrition, sleep, exercise, everything that you know creates a good environment for the brain to thrive. Then there's tenacity, which is often what people really associate with resilience, which is persistence, motivation, optimism. And then, of course, collaboration, which is about human connection, trust, you know, building good support networks. And it's really skills across all of those that, you know, the more we practice those skills, the more we can activate our resilience in different situations, in different moments, and all kinds of different uh, challenges that we face. And that gives us that comprehensive ability to basically feel really confident in ourselves, regardless of, you know, what, what comes our way. That's interesting that collaboration is part of that mix because, you know, some people might think resilience, well, that's my capacity to, you know, go it alone, you know, and to, to, to plow through, but you're saying, yeah. no, this, this aspect of collaboration is important. 
Yeah, so the human connection is an important part of resilience because it's. I think it's also part of what gives us a sense of meaning in life is things that involve other people and the, having that connection, that support, and uh, and that recognition that I can ask for help when I need it. I I'm not alone because if people feel that they're totally alone in the things that they're doing, then it it can reduce their resilience in in the longer term. Maybe in the short term, you feel like yeah. yeah. I can do it, mm -hmm. but then in the mm -hmm. long term, it just kind of reduces uh, your, your overall mental health. So it's yeah an important part of sustainability, which is uh, one of the important concepts of, of resilience, really. You mentioned meaning making, and that is something um, also, uh, I was having a conversation with a group of schizophrenics the other day. And, um, and as you do, as, as, as you do. And, and um, one of the guys was saying that his whole experience is it's all been about meaning making about trying to make sense and make and, and uh, create a, a meaning for his life. Mm. Now, if there's not that, I'm guessing as, as you're articulating that our resilience is going to be low if we don't have any meaning. Yes. And that's, that's an interesting one because actually what we saw in the 2017 research paper that I published about the predictive six factor resilience model, where we saw that that domain of vision of meaning, that is actually the most accurate predictor of overall resilience. And in a way it's the most important part of resilience because if you have that sense of meaning in life, then it provides guidance to everything else that you're doing. It you know, allows you to figure out like what's important, what's not important, what can you not worry about? What are you gonna direct your energies to? What are you gonna be persistent about? And that really gives so much more clarity in life that helps you to make sense of life. And, uh, and it's one of, those, one of those interesting things where uh, it's one of the kind of the miscommunications in a way where a lot of people feel like they need to discover the meaning of life, but it is really something that you decide in a way you, you, you make that meaning, like you're saying, and, uh, and doing that gives you that clarity about, yeah, this is what I choose my life is going to be about. And that's where it comes back to that advancing despite adversity to advance towards that meaning that you've chosen for yourself. Yeah. I, I, I use a, uh, just a, uh, well, well, I use a simple model. I mean, I've, I've observed and articulated a, a, a model that I see in, in life and I feel in myself, which is very much just what any other word choose, just uh, do it. So it's, it's basically we choose or decide and or they're sort of, uh, they're sort of a bit hand in glove, choosing and deciding. Mm. Uh, we act, um, we see what happens, then we learn uh, and we learn the good things and we learn the bad things. And then we are better at choosing, and uh, and and then better in our in our actions, and uh, you know I can see in 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 each of these these domains they all give um, qualitative as as well as quantitative but qualitative aspects to the nature of choosing, you know you, you so you choose in relation to meaning you choose in relation to collaboration you choose in relation to, uh, so that's a really that's a really interesting um, uh, framework that you've you've brought up there. Yeah, and and I think that's it's something that was important to me as well is that it is something that is fairly pragmatic because these are all skills that we can develop, we can actively work on. It's not like personality traits that are kind of set and you know, that's, that's pretty much it. But here, these are all things you can think about, you can work on them, you can practice them. And as you do that, of course, and you're building those neural pathways that uh, create new structures that in, in, enhance your ability to regulate uh, you know, the limbic brain activation, frontal cortex activation, and so on, so that when challenges arise, you have, you've made good choices in the past, essentially, that allow you to now manage that situation in a more constructive and a healthier way than the way that you look back at and go, yeah, that was good. And if it wasn't, then you learn from it and, uh, and you basically continue forward. And I'll just add another one quickly in there as well, because that's one of the things we talk about when we do workshops with people on vision and setting your meaning, which is, you know, don't worry about getting it right. Just, just pick something for now and you can change it later. It's, it's, it's just, you know, just give you something to start working towards, test it and see what happens. Yeah, which is the act. That's, that's the act. Yeah. I, can, I can hear it in that. It's a, it, it is, it is a, because that, that's one of the other uh, things I think, which is, uh, I'm not sure, I'd be interested to hear what you say in relation, it's a negative for resilience. And that's this over-dependency upon predictability, on, on certainty. 
um, that, uh, you know, sort of like I'm doing this resilience thing. So I, so I, I'll do my exams and then I'll get a good mark. Uh, so that when it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily transpire, then there's a whole bunch of, of, of negative and, and destructive things that it's what mm. you're saying, but before resilience is that ability to, to manage the situations, uh, in, in the moment as you go. Yeah, and, and it's getting that confidence as well that regardless of what happens, I'll be okay. Because yeah, you, start to, yeah. Yeah, mm. you start to develop that capacity of um, like, okay, that didn't work out, but this happened and that other thing happened, this didn't happen, but now I've got these new ways I can think about this, I can be resourceful, I can figure out uh, what, you know, something good to do with these things and still kind of work towards that thing that gives me a sense of meaning. Now, you're in a remarkable position to be able to survey a lot of people um, across a lot of, you know, different disciplines. Yeah. And, and, and so what are you finding in terms of our general state of resilience? Well, I found that during COVID, things didn't go so well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Surprise. So and it was quite a, quite a bit of a dive that we took. Uh, in terms of our, our national resilience level. So we basically started, if you think of the PR6 going from zero to 100% resilience, uh, we started off at about 70% in Australia, which is kind of the, the average level of resilience that we had in our original research as well. And then pretty soon after we dropped down to about 64%, uh, which in our population level is quite a big change. And, uh, and then later on, and even as, as Delta came out, then we dropped down even more to mm -hmm. about 62, 63%, which is, was quite a big change. And now, you know, we started to come up a little bit again, but there was something really interesting in the numbers that we found when we looked more deeper into them in terms of when does resilience actually start to provide a level of protection against mental illness like uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression uh, because you know most of us you know have about 70 percent resilience you know that is that is the average but what we notice is that that level of resilience does not necessarily protect you against developing mental illness so maybe you need to go through something really difficult and you go through you know the pandemic or whatever and your risk of starting to experience the symptoms of depression or, or anxiety can actually be quite high because the 70% resilience level is not protective yet. And what we noticed instead is when you go into the high resilience range, which is around 85% resilience, then there's about a five times higher level of protection against developing symptoms of depression and anxiety. So, and that, that number started to make a lot more sense to me in terms of how, and my experience with people as well in the past, where you know, most people, when you ask them, are you resilient? Then they go, yeah. yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. most people don't actually know those skills of resilience that well, that they are protected against all these you know, different types of situations that might come up. And, uh, and that's where 85% kind of gives us that idea of, this is kind of the target of where we should really get up to, to actually start to protect us and to change the, the broader trends in mental you know, health uh, at a population level, because if we can shift people into there, then down in you know, years down the track, we can actually start to re reduce the number of people that experience these type of mental illnesses. But only one in 10 people are actually in that 85% plus range. So nine right. out of 10 people actually have a lot of opportunity to learn and because, and they are actually at higher risk where they are currently. Right. So that um, average sense of resilience mm -hmm. when adverse events happen, it, it takes a bit of a dive, but if you're yeah. above a certain threshold, it sounds like you're able to ride through adverse conditions fairly well. Yeah. So, and that, mm. and that, to me, that just that concept is so interesting that an average level of resilience is not protective. Mm. Mm. And so and that's, that was always the thing yeah. that we saw that you know, a lot of people, a lot of teams score at that average level and they go like, oh, we're average. Great. And I'm like, yeah. 
It's not actually a good thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, you, if you saw you need to recalibrate the, the scale, yeah. and so that, that 70% yeah. is, becomes yeah, a need, 50%. You need to go there. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I love that someone was defining, one of the comedians was saying, was saying well, you know, if, if you look at what average is and your average, remember, there are a lot of people worse than you. Which, because there's that balance between, the, but yeah. so so there are some people in a lot of difficulty. I mean, if your average is seventy yeah. and some people are up in 85, 90s, then there's obviously going to be some people who will score in that low area. So their skill capacity is is really what you're talking about. I, I must admit, I, I I look at that linguistically with the word responsibility, uh, mm. that it's our ability to be able to to respond. Uh, and we're not taught response ability. We're taught responsibility, fault and blame, and and you know, you yeah. you know, get out, you're bad. Uh, and so these things, you know, these skills just give them. Uh, uh, they're giving them a a tool uh, that enables them to respond to this 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 difficulty and 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 manage it, uh, if not resolve it, of course, which which is obviously even better. And so are there any particular ones that are of the skills that are most not not a, around? You know, it's like some you're teaching them, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they go, oh, no, I didn't know anything about that one. Are there there's some particular ones that people really don't have? Yeah, there are there are some ones that are they're always going to get a bit of attention when people start to think about it, like uh, like cognitive reappraisal, where there was a, that really interesting research that they did that was. Uh, two groups of people, they, they told them, okay, you're going to present on a topic and, uh, and it's going to be a really important presentation. You're going to be presenting to a whole lot of really intelligent people. So they really, you know, up the anxiety of those two groups. And, and then for the one group, they just left them to it and left them in their anxiety. And the other group, they said, you know, think about, you know, how exciting an opportunity this is. Think about you know the 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 the, the people you're going to meet, the feedback you're going to get, what a good experience this is going to be, uh, and all the things that you learn through this. So basically, shifting that anxiety over to excitement, which is similar level of intensity, so it, it feels natural because the, the physical uh, sensations are similar, but shifting it from a negative space emotion to something that's it's mm. more positive, mm. then you know they went off, did their presentations. They asked the two groups there, how do you feel that you did? The ones that were more anxious didn't feel so good about it. The ones that were you know, more excited felt good about it. But then what's interesting is they got the audience to rate them as well in a, in a, in a double blind type of way. And, uh, and the audience also rated the people who felt excited as having done better than the other ones that, that didn't. And, and it's really just those type of skills where you start to understand that you can, in all kinds of different situations, you can shift over and, and reappraise the situation, reappraise the emotion that you have. And, and as you do that more and more, then you start to create this whole different perspective on life that, that kind of pervades every experience that you have. So there's little skills like that, which is just one of the composure skills where when people really internalize that, it really just changes their, their experience of life overall. And a lot of people just don't really think about it. Some people kind of do it automatically, but they never really realize it. Uh, but it's those type of things when we start to clarify them, when we start to teach them, then it makes a big difference for people. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a small thing, um, but as we know in mm -hmm. complex systems theory, a small a small change can make a yeah, huge yes, difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now um, you talk about uh, so there is an economic um, impact uh, on our resilience, especially when we're talking about a, a national resilience. Uh, what do you know about uh, how much this could save us, or how much it costs when we're not resilient? Yeah, and. And there, of course, there are a whole lot of different aspects that are impacted when, uh, when we, we don't have resilience. Naturally, what we are at risk of, of course, is higher risk of mental illness and things like that, that, is, that becomes more debilitating down the track. Mm. And, and that's when we need to access uh, therapy. It's when you know, there's impact to our ability to, to you know, just be employees and do good work. Uh, so there's this workplace impacts and all of that. So we, we did a bit of calculations there and, and all that. And, uh, and essentially what it comes down to is around $2,000 uh, 
per person uh, cost that we can save by increasing resilience to you know, by about 25%. Yeah, and, and that's the type of thing when you expand it at a population level, then it becomes billions of dollars yeah. uh, because there is you know, much less strain on the health system. There's less strain on, uh, on businesses as well. And the benefit is really for individuals because they feel good about themselves. They enjoy life more. They feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm moving forward. I'm doing things that matter. And, and yeah, there's, there's difficult things happening, but I've got the skills to handle it. So that's kind of where we've got this dream of, you know, can we move the, the, the broader population up by about 25% so that we can change that, you know, one in 10 uh, people at, at the high resilience range yeah. to instead be maybe, you know, four in 10 or something like yeah. that. This is just just stirring in, in my mind, just sort of pairing and getting some data and figures and things. And I'm suddenly thinking Scandinavian countries that mm. tend to have higher degrees of, of success. They have higher degrees of, uh, of um, uh, educational success with, with much less pressure. There's lots of stories about how they, uh, they, they do these things. And I'm just wondering, have you had any thoughts about uh, the nature of resilience in those sorts of countries or the nature in their capacities. Uh, is there something particular going on up there or, or are, uh, are those statistics related to different things? Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. So, uh, so Jorgen Herlofsson, he's one of our science advisors. He's over in Sweden. So we often talk about these, these kind of things as well. And, and they've got all kinds of other challenges as well at the same time. So because we do assessments across different countries. And for example, we looked at the United States as well, where, uh, where Australia went like this. And then the United States had their, uh, their elections and they went like this <laughs> over yeah, a couple of quarters. Yeah. So, so it's, it, there was a whole bunch of really interesting factors going on and what exactly it's it's kind of the difference between all of them is i think it's a bit anecdotal and all that there's a lot more mm. research we need to do to, <laughs> to figure yeah, out yeah there's yeah there's lots of yeah. lots of great questions to answer yeah, yeah. yeah. but when, when i think about some of the um stimulus programs that we do to try to you know get an economy you know up and going and this seems like a a really uh, obvious basic one in terms of our yeah resilience and and, and mental health and yet um uh, well, I don't know. You're you're in the game. So, how much are we doing of this? Yeah, and and I think that's where we've had almost at a government policy level has been the challenge of what can we actually invest in that actually makes a difference. And mm. I think that's where you know treatment and all that gets most of the funding because that's when the crisis is most clear. So, you know, things are on fire. We need to put the fire out, so we put money into putting the fires out. Right. But you know, preventing those type of things from happening—that's often where there's a lot of argument about what really works. And because there's argument, there ends up being less funding for it, so there's not as much investment. Uh, so that's one of the things that we are trying to change with this to try and change at, uh, at, at the, the country level and the and a global level is the understanding and the science around prevention as uh, and what type of prevention can more reliably impact the, the amount of people that develop mental illness down on the track. So, and, and thereby, you know, clarifying this version of resilience, this understanding of it, this implementation and assessment of it can have a meaningful impact and thereby we can invest more in this. So, and that's where we're starting to see more traction around that. Uh, it's it's nice that there are some government agencies that are actually called you know resilience departments and uh, uh, like New South Wales resilience uh, over here for example helped to fund a big program that we're doing with uh, the fire and rescue and the state emergency services and those guys and uh, and other you know resilience similar departments uh, coming up in other uh, other states as well so. We're starting to move in the right direction. Mm, mm, it's yeah. still a bit slow, but it's because they're all all really want to see the research. They want to see this make a difference. But ultimately, that shift is happening, especially in organizations as well. About mm. we're doing a lot in treatment, but we need to do more in prevention. Well, it, yeah. well it, it is that thing of uh, when you have the the treatment or the the, the healing 
um, or the, the 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 resolving of the illness, the illness mentality is that. Yeah. Um, uh, so, and I do see the point that there. I mean, because there might be lots of people. I mean, there's lots of people who do come up and say, "I have the, you know, I have the the secret yeah. to prevention," and so things have to be tested because you know I just think it's some something really obvious. Like no one would imagine that um, giving people good food is not a good prevention method for uh, for getting sick. But then we kind of still had to prove that. And we so there's that sense of it's almost like we we almost have to get sick, find what makes us better, and then um, implement that in, in an in an earlier stage. And you know, just like the giving the broad example of something like antibiotics. You know, we learned that antibiotics kill the bacteria and we say, oh, that makes us much better. Also, it's bacteria. Also, if we have less bacteria, so if we're cleaner, we have um, you know, we wash our hands as we found with COVID, you know, we, we stop the germs moving around, we can actually prevent, but you still got to know what you're talking about. So there's, there's a, it's a tightrope uh, there. So, mm, so congratulations yeah. on doing the, you know, the hard yards of, of, of that evidence providing. That's right. Cause it sounds like a long type type rope. I, I remember someone, oh, yeah. <laughs> someone said once, people you know, what's, wiggling it. Yeah. what's the best, what's the best time to influence a developing child? And he said about a hundred years before the child's born. <laughs> yeah. yeah there are epigenetic weird. things that, you know, go from, from generation to generation that impacts resilience as well. So. And then getting cultural yeah. changes. Yeah. 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 Um, so working with, um, you know, all of these different groups and that that you do, uh, I wanted to talk about um, sort of excellence and high performance. Um, what are you doing in terms of, you know, going from from average to great in terms of performance across, well, you know, whatever domain? I think really when you look at all the domains and all the different skills and all of them is when you really start to practice and master those different skills, mm -hmm. then that's really when we start to go from good to great because we get so much more access in terms of uh, being able to manage different situations more effectively than we did before and, uh, and being able to, to summon those skills very quickly and almost automatically in different situations so that we become really effective uh, regardless of what we what we need to go through and uh, actually on my fridge over there i've got yeah. these uh, these fridge magnets <laughs> which uh, are the six domains and all the different skills and it, it's almost that type of thing where um like as as people develop their skills and the, you know put all the magnets up there you know with all the skills that they've mastered and having that constant understanding of what those skills are to be able to use them at any time. And, and it's the type of thing that uh, as part of where we've worked with uh, quite a few sports teams in the past as well, where there are just all these things that we need to be able to master in life. It's not just about the, the playing field. It is about at home and the relationships there. And how do we manage all these other things that might cloud our mind in that moment when we need to really perform? So the more we manage our entire lives and everything else, the more confident we are in that moment when we really need to focus. Yeah, absolutely. And I would imagine that the more people we have getting to those excellent levels, the better it will be, you know, generally on a national level. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's the kind of concept where it starts to transform communities as well. Mm -hmm. When we have these, we're in, as individuals, we're more resilient. Uh, we know how to support each other and, and I think that's one of the interesting things about resilience is that the more resilient you are, the less worried you are about other people and other things that are happening, the less, you know, the less the fear systems of the brain activate. And we actually become more accepting of other people, regardless of their differences. We become more tolerant, we become more compassionate. And it's, it's that kind of concept where if at a global level, we can increase resilience, we might actually solve a lot of societal issues that we have just by you know people becoming more open and, and accepting of others. It sounds like it might also be a panacea for stupidity, which we see a lot of um, on the global stage. <laughs> I, I actually wrote that down. It said people aren't necessarily smart uh, all the time. And and that's not as a negative criticism. It's just that the 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 um it's kind of this stuff is is beaten out of us a bit. The, the, the world kind of gets out of our reach. And, um, and even quite clever people can start to go, oh, I just don't know what the hell to do. 
Yeah, it's the it's that activation of fear because they're so because fear sells. Fear gets people to look at media articles and you know click on things. So there's a lot of algorithms and things like that that are being taught that hey, if I make people afraid, people will use my service more. So therefore, I will promote more fear in the world, and uh, and that's one of the big challenges for us as a society, which is that. That's kind of just how the brain works. And there's media and all these uh, other you know, agencies out there that are trying to make their businesses work. And the only thing that they really find that works is if they promote fear. And uh, <laughs> so, so it's, a, yeah. it's a bit of a challenge for us. Yeah, and, that's uh, interesting that. Yes, because if, if you actually ramp up fear, uh, that would... I imagine, well, certainly that would that would pull down some of those six domains. It would make those six domains less mm. uh, less self-generating. So that's why you need to, I guess you need to relearn them and go, just a minute, this is making yeah. me be less cognitively aware because I'm afraid and so I'm not I'm not thinking. And so I need to I need to forcibly or or by self-determination uh, mm. activate this stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you find that like people that have a high level of resilience, do they, when, when they're presented with, you know, a fear campaign, uh, that they're more likely to stop and think and, and appraise, well, what's really going on here? You know, let's think about mm. this. Mm. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly the kind of thing that happens. Because if we think about resilience at a neuroscience basis in a very oversimplified way, it's essentially teaching us like all those different skills teaches us how do we downregulate kind of the, the fear activation and upregulate our ability to, to, to think clearly about the situation and to have a more accurate appraisal about what's actually going on. So exactly that type of thing then when if you have really high resilience and you would look at these type of things that are happening, you won't feel threatened by it. And through that, you have the ability to look at it more objectively, more clearly, and see that you know, actually it's, it's, it's not that bad. It's like if there's another lockdown coming, then it's not like instantly your fear systems activate. Now you're thinking very impulsively and acting and, uh, and uh, feel you know, strong emotions about it, but rather you can say, oh, you know, that's okay. You know, the previous ones weren't that bad. You know, we'll, we'll get through this, it's fine. And, uh, and yep. you can just kind of go about your life and, and it doesn't really affect you that much. So th that point on its own is, uh, is, a, is a great selling point for, for resilience. We all need to be more resilient just to you know, you be able to think clearly about these fear campaigns, which are, you know, rife mm -hmm. on the planet. So this, this uh, yeah, so there's, I mean, there's a cognitive override to it to some extent, but as you get these, this confidence, as you say. So confidence in itself is actually is more an emotional state. So although you do have to think of these things, you think, oh, just a minute and check it in. It's also developing that um, that automatic um, attitude of, no, oh, I can do this. I can do this. Not I can do this. No, no, no. But I, I, I know if I put my mind to it and I apply my skills, I yeah. can do this. So that is an automatic first emotion rather than that one of, oh, God, this is going to get me. I'm not going to do this. Uh, so there'd be a little bit of a, a lag time as they're learning skills for it to becoming more of a, a confident uh, in mindset. Yeah. That's right, because it's resilience is not something that you just you know attend a workshop and now you're resilient for the rest of your right. life. It's something right. that it's basically like a muscle, same as you know you need to keep exercising to to stay in shape. And if you stop exercising, then the kind of goes you know fitness level goes down. Same right. with mental fitness in a way as well, where you need to keep practicing these skills, you need to keep building those neural pathways and maintaining them. And uh, and that's and that's where yeah exactly like you're saying you might experience a situation something might happen that you've never gone through before and you have confidence even though you don't know the answer yet about how you're going to handle it you know you are going to handle it and you are going to be okay and you're going to figure it out and uh, and it's that type of thing that again it just makes you feel calmer in that situation helps you to think clearly about it helps you to actually figure out and be more resourceful and figure out like mm -hmm. yeah i can use this i can do that i have options it's okay i don't need to worry about it and that's, that's yeah. where the resilience yeah. comes in. Excellent. Well, Yuri, as we sort of round this conversation out, uh, we're, most of the people that will be listening will be mental health professionals. So I'm wondering if you could let them know how you can help them and what sort of things are available for them. Yeah, so we have about 500 or so 
psychologists and coaches and so on who have completed uh, the Certified Resilience Coach or CREC program, which goes through this whole modality of uh, the PR6, all the research that's around it, the assessments that are available for it, and uh, and the the tools that we have to start to be able to teach people these concepts. And uh, and then more recently, we've also launched the Resilience First Aid program, mm. which is a, a two-day certification course, which is going through all the accreditations and everything as well, which is more about learning those skills about how can we talk to people to support resilience in others. And, uh, and that's an interesting one. We've, we've even had people who are using it towards the end of therapy where people are now feeling more confident about themselves and then having resilience first aid come in at that point okay. to yeah. build them up even higher because there's always that, that chance of relapse and so on that we, if we can prevent that by building resilience and giving people more skills so that they become champions with their own authentic story that they take out to, to their friends and family. Uh, those type of things that uh, that come in really handy with uh, resilience first aid. Okay, brilliant. Uh, any f- final words to our listeners before we wrap up? I I really just want people to think about is getting from from average to high resilience. You know, going for that. I'm thinking about that themselves as well. About what can I do to actually start to invest in my own mindset so that uh, so that it's something that. I can keep working on. I can also be someone that can support others around me as well. And um, there's always more for us to learn and we just need to, to keep learning and stay consistent, be resilient. Okay. Brilliant. Really appreciate what you're doing um, for humanity, really. I mean, you know, for the country, but you know, for, for Mm. the world in, in raising our resilience. (laughs) It's brilliant. Should be more of it. Fantastic. Thanks, Yuri Rosso, for, for being here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's been wonderful talking. Right. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Yuri. <laughs>